afternoon, everyone. My name is Robert Hayes. I'm the Community Outreach Librarian and Head of Technical Services at the Tewksbury Public Library. Uh, we're just going to give it about 15 seconds to wait for folks to file on in from the waiting room. And I just also want to confirm that we're live on Facebook as well. So we'll give it another 10 seconds or so. Uh, while we wait for those who uh, feel comfortable doing so, certainly no obligation, but for those uh, who are comfortable doing so, uh, feel free in the chat to let Sue and, Sue and I know where you're joining us from. So if you're comfortable doing so, let us know in the chat where you're joining us from. Uh, just to set expectations, I anticipate the program lasting approximately an hour or so. Uh, we are in Zoom webinar mode, so Sue and I cannot see you or hear you. Uh, if you want to communicate with us, you can write comments in the chat and you can write uh, type in questions into the Q&A box. Uh, we will address all comments and questions at the end of the presentation. Um, we're going to have Sue present uninterrupted and then we'll take questions and comments at the very end. But feel free to type as we go. Uh, we'll keep an eye and I will uh, make sure that uh, I relay all questions and comments at the end. Uh, also, uh, just know that I am recording today's presentation. Again, we can't see you or hear you, but I am supposed to let you know we are recording today's presentation for, uh, for the uh, town's local access TV station and for the library's YouTube channel. Uh, and as I think I just mentioned in addition, we're also currently live on the library's Facebook page. Uh, feel free to go over there and give us a like and give us a share. We would appreciate that. Uh, last thing is we will, I will be sending out an email probably Monday morning with a link to a feedback survey. Uh, please take 30 or 60 seconds, fill that out. Let us know what you thought of this afternoon's event and what you'd like to see for future events here from the Tewksbury Library. Uh, and then of note, uh, this afternoon's program is sponsored by the Friends of the Tewksbury Public Library. Want to thank them for their generosity, and they will be launching a uh, community cookbook next month. In about a, in a few weeks, uh, they'll be selling a, a cookbook that consists of recipes um, from more than 50 Tewksbury residents. So keep an eye out for that. That's one of their major uh, summer fundraisers. All right, so this afternoon on this beautiful 80 degree day here in Tewksbury, we are uh, here for the history of theater on Cape Cod. Author and theater reviewer Sue Mellon lifts the curtain on the rich history of theater on Cape Cod in this Zoom webinar. She paints a vivid picture of early years of American drama on the Culture Ritz Peninsula, bringing attendees into the world of Eugene O'Neill and the Provincetown Players, the Barnstormers and other early groups. Then as she does in her book, A History on Theater on Cape, oops, a history of theater on Cape Cod. Uh, she takes audiences on a tour of the Cape's many faceted theater history, uh, theater, uh, theater history, giving theater lovers an insider's view of what has made Cape theater great. Let me give you a little bit more about Sue before I formally turn things over to her. Uh, Sue began her writing career as an arts, entertainment, and features writer for the Cape Cod Times. She next went on to work in public relations first for a regional healthcare system, and then for a classic car museum. That's pretty cool. Uh, <laughs> then after a short stint as a freelance business and technology writer, she began a content creation firm called Your Writers, which still operates to this day. Uh, through her company, she has co-written and ghost-written dozens of books for a wide range of clients. She has also taught writing at uh, Northern Essex Community College nearby for a number of years. After an extended hiatus, um, Sue has returned to her first love, reviewing the theatrical productions that grace the historic theaters of Cape Cod. And exploring the histories of these theater groups uh, that dot the Cape has been her pure joy. So all of us watching live on Facebook and on Zoom, let's give a big virtual Ooh. round of applause to Sue for joining us this afternoon. Sue, thank you for bringing the Cape Cod weather down here to Tewksbury. And uh, Sue, you can take it away. Thanks so much. Thanks so much, Robert. Oh, it's so nice to be here. It's so nice to be here with all of you on this beautiful day. So thanks for, for doing this program with us today. And um, I'm just thrilled to be here. Uh, I should tell you that actually I lived in your area for 25 years in Tingsboro. So I want you to know that that, that was a, a wonderful place to live and to raise my children. Uh, but, but actually my interest in theater began about 40 years ago 
when I first stepped foot on the stages of a number of theaters on Cape Cod, I was I was here in the 70s and 80s living in the Cape and I, I did a bunch of acting. So I actually performed on some historic theaters in some historic theaters on historic stages. One of them being Monomoy Theater in Chatham and one of them, um, the Barnstable Comedy Club which is actually a hundred years old, but will be a hundred years old next year in, uh, in 2022. And Monomoy Theater in Chatham uh, dates back to the early 1930s. And, and then I also acted in, uh, on the Harwich Junior Theater stage, which is now the Cape Cod uh, Theater Company. And then in the uh, Cape Cod Community College Players. And so all of this I found to be an absolutely magical and transformative experience. So I, I wanted to tell that story because at root, at heart, I'm a writer. And so I wanted to tell the story of, of the, the magical experience of, um, of theater and being on stage. So I was lucky enough to begin writing reviews and, uh, and articles, feature articles about the theater culture and about uh, arts and entertainment in general on, on Cape Cod. So I did that for about 10 years. And then I went off to, to college. I went to uh, Boston University. And then I got married and had children and went to the North Shore and then to Tingsboro and um, raised my children for, for 25 years in Tingsboro, and then went off to Florida for a while, and then found my way back to Cape Cod. And it's an interesting thing that there's something truly magical about Cape Cod, about the environment, about the, the weather, uh, about the light, the, the famous Cape Cod light, and so I found my way back, back to Cape Cod. And that happens to so many people that they come here either uh, in a return visit or they come here for the first time because of the magic on Cape Cod. And that's really what was happening at the end of the 19th and the beginning of the 20th century. People are artists and, and playwrights and, and uh, literary stars and, and actors were coming to art colonies on the Cape. And one of those was in Provincetown. And another, actually, there was also a, a, a very early art colony, artist colony and actors colony on the Isle of Nantucket in the town of Sconset. And, and that actually was composed of, of uh, actors who came from families with generations of history in theater. So after a while, what happened logically enough was that the theater culture spread across the Cape and across the islands. But I'm gonna tell you that story in a minute in the video that I'm going to show you, but um, I wanted to get back to a, a little bit about what um, brought me to writing this book. So when I came back to the Cape, I realized that the theater culture was truly thriving, uh, more so than when I had left in the 70s and 80s. And I, I was somewhat surprised to, to find just how much the theater culture had grown and how much and how it was thriving um, in, in this, this new era. So I decided that what I wanted to do was to tell that story, was to tell the story of the evolution of that theater culture and, and how it grew over time. And, and actually that hadn't been done despite the fact that, that the Cape really is the birthplace of American drama. That hadn't been done in, uh, in a very long time, not since, since a, a well-known Cape theater reviewer named Evelyn Lawson had actually written a book, uh, Theater on Cape Cod. So I decided to do that. And the way that I approached it 
was as a tour starting in in Provincetown, which which is really the the beginning of um, the beginning of American drama, but um, the beginning of, of Cape theater culture. And so I started in, in Provincetown and then in the book, I work my way up Cape uh, from Provincetown and then explore the history in every area of the Cape. And there is history and early history in every area of, uh, of Cape Cod. So I go all the way to Falmouth and to the islands and look at the, the people and the events that, that have made Cape Theater history, where in fact, the Cape Playhouse is the oldest continually operating summer theater in America. So I hope that for one thing, I hope that I have uh, uh, done justice to um, Evelyn Lawson, who, who wrote the definitive history of theater back in the, in the early 60s. And I hope that what I've done is shown more and more people that they can come to the Cape and, and bask in this, this magical world, not only our sun, but the, um, the light of, uh, the magical light of theater on Cape Cod. So um, I'm going to show you now a video that um, delves into that theater. Let me uh, get this video up. across Nantucket Sound to the town of Falmouth, then there was a group. It's a summer's eve on Cape Cod, and everywhere there are the sounds of waves lapping against the shore, gulls crying out, and children laughing and chattering as they play an endless game of tag with the waves. But there are also other sounds. There's the soaring sound of an orchestra tuning up, and the sound of laughter at perfectly played physical comedy, and then dramatic lines hitting the air like a knife blade. Those are the sounds of summer theater on Cape Cod. Every summer and increasingly into the fall season, people come from all over the world to see New York quality theater on Cape Cod without the hustle and bustle and heat and grit and grime of the city. They're treated to world-class theater. In fact, according to the Cape Cod Theater Coalition, 600,000 people actually view performances in a normal summer on Cape Cod. Now, unfortunately, this past summer has not been what we would call an average summer on the Cape. Unfortunately, the theaters have been darkened, but theaters have continued through the pandemic to produce virtual productions and performances and acting classes all through the summer and have continued so into the fall. So what is it about theater on Cape Cod that makes it world quality? And one of the things is fierce competition. There are actually more than three dozen theater companies and that number is continuing to increase every year. So three dozen theater companies across the small spit of land and the islands on Cape Cod. But there's something more. There's a long standing tradition of theater on the Cape that goes back more than a hundred years. In fact, it all began in what was once a sleepy little fishing village called Provincetown, which became a Mecca for artists and writers and playwrights and performers. And to this day is still a Mecca for artists of, of every description. 
And that theater tradition traveled across the Cape, up and down and into the islands. So let's look at where it all began. And that's at the land's end. Or for our purposes, we might say the land's beginning. So at the beginning of the 20th century, there was really a revolution in all of the arts and all around the world. There were writers like Henry David Thoreau and Henry James, and then visual artists like Monet and Manet, and of course, Pablo Picasso in Europe, who were breaking new ground. And what they wanted to do was to break free of the strictures of European style, theater and, and the arts and literature and create something that was uniquely modern. And in Provincetown, there was an artist, Charles Webster Hawthorne, who in fact had a school for artists, and he was teaching a technique called En Plain Air. Now, as the name sort of tells you, it, it was exactly what it says. It was teaching artists to create the natural world, to translate the natural world in a natural way to canvas. And that was attracting, beginning with visual artists, was bringing in visual artists from places like Boston and New York, where they would hop on a train and then eventually wend their way to the forming artist colony in Provincetown. And in fact, by 1916, the Boston Globe had printed a headline that said, world's greatest and biggest artist colony in Provincetown. And playwrights were making their way to this colony as well. One of them was Susan Glass Bell, who was a well-known playwright in her time. And she was actually convincing other artists and performers and playwrights to make their way to the art colony in Provincetown. And one of those was Eugene O'Neill. And he was a, a fledgling playwright at the time. And if you know anything about theater history, then that's a name that should jump out on you. Because without exaggeration, Eugene O'Neill was responsible for transforming American drama into a truly American art form. In fact, in a little play called Bound East for Cardiff, which was produced on, for the first time, was staged in a little rickety fishing house that was transformed into a little, <clears throat> in a little theater in a wharf on, in P-Town. And that was on July 28th in 1916. And that was really the beginning. That and other works of his that followed were the very beginning of American drama as we know it today. He created characters that were uniquely American. In fact, his lead character in Bound East was Yank and dealt with subjects that were uniquely American, like class issues that weren't being dealt with in other places at that time. So through that summer of 1916, the uh, little vanguard of playwrights continue to produce works, avant-garde works of their own and to perform in one another's plays and, and direct one another's plays. So it became this thriving art community, artist community uh, in Provincetown. Then by the fall, uh, they decided to take their success and go to Gotham with it. So they went to New York, which they thought was going to be just one season. And actually, it turned out to be seven seasons that they were in New York. And they inhabited a theater um, that was originally called the Playwrights Theater. And then uh, became known as the Provincetown Playhouse, obviously as a nod to their beginnings in Provincetown. So during that time, however, they were going back and forth between New York and, and Provincetown and continue to, to act in, in, um, in productions on the wharf. Unfortunately, though, in 1917, the Little Wharf Theater 
burned down and by 1922 had been swept away by a fierce storm into the sea. But that didn't mean that theater was done in Provincetown. In fact, the activity moved to the west side of P-Town to a barn. Uh, of all places for a theater. Frank Shea, who was a bookseller and a fledgling playwright in his own right, actually opened his barn on the west side of Provincetown. And his troupe of players became known as the Barnstormers. And in fact, the Provincetown players uh, also acted with Frank in the barn. And over time, a a uh, couple of factions actually formed of the Barnstormers. There was one that was dedicated to the avant-garde works of people like O'Neill and Glassfell and Edna St. Vincent Millay. But at the same time, there was another faction that was sort of stuck in tradition. And this was kind of uh, led by an actress named Mary Bicknell, who uh, eventually formed her own group of players called the Wharf Players. And they uh, took residence in a, uh, a little Wharf Theater again, which was a, sort of the second iteration of the Wharf Theaters in Provincetown. So this was at 83 Commercial Street, but there's a little piece of theater trivia that's, that's sort of interesting here. There was no love lost between these two factions. And in fact, theater trivia tells us that the new Wharf players left, left absconded with theater benches and props to prove their disdain for the barnstormers before they, uh, they inhabited their Wharf theater. So, but, but that sort of takes us away from the very early years that that was probably into the 1930s. And there was also very early activity going on in other areas of Cape Cod. For example, on the Isle of Nantucket, there was an actor's colony that formed in the town of Seaconset. And this was known as the Sconset Actors Colony. And they were actually, it was actually made up of people who had long traditions uh, they were members of families that had long traditions in theater. And like the group in Provincetown, they were also looking for a place where they could see what their own pens could do and their own performances could do. So they began by performing in various locales around Sconset and then created a really expansive artist colony, uh, which in fact included a tennis court and a bowling alley. And then eventually they created what was called the Sconset Casino, which offered them a lot of space, uh, a lot of room for big productions and for bigger audiences. So they were able to create some, some really um, spectacular productions at that time. And it's important to know that they were actually the seed for a group that continues to this day in Provincetown uh, in Nantucket. The Theater Workshop of Nantucket actually continues to produce everything from light comedy to serious drama and um, have a long and continuing history on the island. So uh, again, there were other areas and a, another was Falmouth. If you take a short hop back across Nantucket Sound to the town of Falmouth, then there was a group that formed in the early 20s called the University Players. And the University Players, as their name implies, was made up of students from Harvard and Princeton and Radcliffe, and then a number of other universities and colleges in the area. And that actually became home to a number of soon to be luminaries, including Henry Fonda and Margaret Sullivan and the noted Broadway 
and film producer Joshua Logan. And in fact, in his autobiography, Joshua Logan talks about his starving artist days in West Falmouth and what that meant to him as he uh, continued in his career. And he said that not only were they totally dedicated to their art, but they were also completely dedicated to each other. And that kind of dedication actually enabled them to create some spectacular productions. They, in fact, created a, a, a production of and all that jazz that uh, for all the world looks like a Busby per Berkeley production. So, and, and this was a group of university students that did this. Sadly, they unfortunately disbanded after a few years, but that certainly didn't mean that theater history was done either on Cape Cod or in Falmouth. In fact, there was an early jewel in the crown of theater on Cape Cod, and that was the Falmouth Playhouse. And this was a magnificent structure that sat on the banks of the Kunameset Lake. And in fact, it included not only a huge theater that, believe it or not, back in the 20s and 30s had a form of air conditioning, but uh, it also had a restaurant and nightclub that overlooked the lake and a, an oval-shaped European-style bar. And this became home to a number of, of uh, stage and screen stars at the time, too, including Tallulah Bankhead and Helen Hayes and Gertrude Lawrence, who we'll talk a little bit about in a minute, but she actually became the wife of Richard Aldrich, who at um, a point in the 1930s took over the, the running of the Falmouth Playhouse along with a number of other theaters on Cape Cod. But, um, but it was a magnificent structure and um, again was home to so many stars. And that actually became uh, a trademark for Richard Aldridge in his star machine that he brought to all four of the theaters that he owned and managed at one time. But again, we're getting a, sort of ahead of ourselves here. So I want to get back to some really early theater history. So uh, the Cape Playhouse, which is the oldest continually operating summer theater in America. And this is in Dennis on 6A, which is the old Kings Highway in Cape Cod. And the Cape Playhouse was actually the brainchild of Raymond Moore, who was one of the Provincetown players. And this is sort of a theme in Cape Cod theater that again and again, the same names crop up because of the expansive and ever growing theater culture. People sort of move from theater to theater and it's continued to this day really that an actor might find a play that appeals to him in Provincetown and then the next week be in a play at the Cape Cod Theater Company in Harwich. So this is sort of a theme of Cape Cod Theater. So Moore uh, was acting with the Provincetown Players and with the Barnstormers and uh, tried his hand at playwriting as well. But he decided that he wanted to start a theater in the commercial and business area of the Cape, so in the Mid-Cape area. So he began looking around in Yarmouth and, and Dennis and then um, sort of really focused on Dennis and actually found a building, the Nupscusset Meeting House, which was 200 years old, which he bought for the princely sum of $200. And then found a parcel of land, a three acre parcel off of 6A, off of the Old Kings Highway, and um, 
had the Nepscusset Meeting House moved there. And apparently this is something that, that happened more regularly around the turn of the centuries and, and into the, the teens and the 20s that buildings were moved. So he found this parcel of land and by 1927, he was ready to open the Cape Playhouse. And um, the first season, in fact, featured a performance by Basil Rathbone. And then the next season featured a performance by a newcomer, Henry Fonda, and another newcomer who actually got her start as an usher at the Cape Playhouse, and then got a little part in a play called Mr. Kim Stops By. Now that play will forever fall into obscurity, but the name of Betty Davis will stay with us forever. So um, that, that was a tradition that began bringing in stars to the Cape Playhouse. And, um, but Moore had more on his mind than just a single theater. He wanted to create an art colony. And so he began using the buildings on the property. One was a junior, became a junior theater, and then one was, was a building for storing props and, and staging. And then another building became the Cape Cinema. Now, the Cape Cinema is still noted around the world for its classic feel and for its attention to classic films and to new avant-garde and foreign films, but it's also noted for a fabulous ceiling mural that was produced by artist Rockwell Kent. And so the cinema opened in 1930 and in fact was the site of the world debut of The Wizard of Oz. So unfortunately, by the 1930s, Moore was beginning to fail both physically and financially. And so he turned over his uh, the, the management of the Cape Playhouse to Richard Aldrich, who was at that time the uh, producing manager of the theater and eventually became its owner and then eventually owned four theaters, as, as we said, the Falmouth Playhouse and the uh, Cape Music Circus, which became the Melody Tent, and then the South Shore Music Circus. And in all of those areas, he brought real star power. And again, as I said, that's continued in the Cape Playhouse, which continues to, to bring in luminaries every year. So, as I said, also Gertrude Lawrence was Mrs. A, how she was known lovingly around the Cape. And she was uh, absolutely a, a force in the arts culture on the Cape and, and in the community around her. And in fact, there is a theater in the Dennis Union Church that bears her name, the Gertrude Lawrence Theater. So that's it. That's the dramatic early history of theater on Cape Cod, beginning in a sleepy little fishing village in Provincetown and creating an unbroken line of evolution that has transferred along the Cape and continues to this day. And as I said earlier, it has been kind of a hard time for theaters on the Cape. They were darkened, but they have continued to produce performances and presentations and classes virtually, and they'll be ready to take to the stage when it's time, because after all, the show must go on. All right, well, thank you everyone. I hope you enjoyed that. Yeah, thank you so much, Sue. Wonderful uh, presentation, great. Uh, recorded comments and the accompanying images. Um, so at this point, uh, Sue, did you want to take questions uh, from the audience? Sure, absolutely. That would be great. All right. Uh, so if anyone on the line has a question for Sue of anything Cape Cod theater related, uh, let it rip. You can type it into the Q&A or into the chat. I'll also keep an eye on Facebook as well. Um, but I guess, Sue, I'll start us off. Um, what was the most... Uh, 
I guess, unexpected or maybe interesting thing you learned uh, about uh, Theater on the Cape that you didn't know before you started the book? Well, absolutely, it was that American drama actually began on Cape Cod, that, that with that, that one show, Bound East for Cardiff, that um, drama, American drama as we know it today, was initiated. That was the very beginning. And so everywhere um, across the country, across the world, where there are uh, uh, dramatic performances that are uniquely American, it started in, in Provincetown with Eugene O'Neill and with the Provincetown players. And, and so, and, and I knew that Eugene O'Neill and the players were uh, active in early theater culture, but I had no idea just how important their influence was. And so that, that was what prompted me to, to want to tell the story. So I think that was probably it. Uh, Joyce wants to know, uh, do you have any comments on the Vineyard Playhouse? Yes, the Vineyard Playhouse, that, that has another uh, long history. Oh, they go back to uh, many old buildings where, where the, the players performed early um, in, the, in the 20th century. In fact, there was one old sea captain's house where the early performers in, in the um, uh, Vineyard Playhouse performed. And so they have been around for a very long time. And I'm really happy to say that uh, I, I just did a radio program the other day and the, um, the uh, producing director of the, the Martha's Vineyard Playhouse was on the call, was on the program. And she was saying that, that they're going to have a full schedule this summer and that they are in fact once again, going to be doing uh, Shakespeare um, in their outside amphitheater. So this is something that they do from, from year to year. And uh, it's Shakespeare for the masses is what they call it. And so that is perfectly suited to this, this sort of post pandemic era that uh, they'll be performing outside, as well as a number of theaters on the Cape um, who have announced actually full schedule and um, many of them will be performing outside. They have outside theaters that are going up even as we speak. And um, so people can, can come to the Cape and see theater and know that they're going to be safe this summer. And Sue, you, you sort of touched on this, but I, but I know, I think you said there's over 36 uh, theater groups um, uh, on, uh, down on the Cape and um, yeah. lots, of, lots of buildings. Do, do, you have a, do you have a favorite theater group and a favorite theater? Or is that like asking you to pick between your, your, your children? Uh, do yeah. you have any, fav any yeah. favorites you can reveal? It, it is that a little bit. Well, I, I just think that that the Barnstable Comedy Club is so impressive because, in, especially in terms of, of the building, because they have been performing in the same building and the same stage since uh, 1922. Uh, their very first production was Lady Windermere's Fan in 1922. And uh, right before the pandemic, when the, as the pandemic was, was beginning, uh, last March uh, in 2020, I reviewed a show there. Um, so it, it's, you know, it's just amazing to, to continue. Uh, and, and in terms of, of quality, uh, the, the, the level of performance is just so high on, on the Cape. And, and one of the things that's so wonderful is, is that um, you, can, you can see classic theater, Gilbert and Sullivan at the College Light Opera Company in Falmouth. And at the same time, you can see brand new um, plays by, by local Cape and Massachusetts writers performed at uh, places like the Cape Repertory Theater in Brewster and the Provincetown um, Theater. Uh, Provincetown Theater, oh, at, speaking of favorites, 
Uh, last year they did um, they did uh, Sweeney Todd, mm -hmm. yeah. Demon Barber of Fleet Street, sure. and it and it was just outstanding, outstanding. So, but but that's really the level of theater that you get on Cape Cod without having to go to New York. Uh, and Sue, you might have mentioned this a little bit. I, I heard Betty White's name dropped, and I know uh, Eugene O'Neill was referenced in the um, description of the program. Any, any, who, who are some of the most famous people to ever perform um, or produce plays down on the Cape? Oh, well, of course, there was Tulula Bankhead, and she was at the Falmouth Playhouse. Um, and, and there's a wonderful story about her. It's said, in fact, that she christened the Falmouth Playhouse by smashing a, a bottle of uh, champagne on one of the theater props. Um, the Fondas, as, as a family, they, um, Henry Fonda and Jane Fonda, have performed at the, at the Cape Playhouse. And as I said, Betty Davis um, started as an usher at the Cape Playhouse. And then there's a, a wonderful story that I uncovered about um, Bonnie Raitt, who has performed often at the, at the Melody Tent, um, about uh, at playing as a child in the aisles as her father, John Raitt, performed in, in the Melody Tent. So, so there are famous names everywhere across the Cape Theatre world. A uh, follow-up question from an anonymous attendee. She says, or he says, I'm not sure. Uh, thank you for the presentation. There certainly is a difference between local theatrical performances versus bringing in major stars. I remember seeing Van Johnson on the Cape during the late 60s, early 70s. And so uh, his or her question is, do you know how, how well received or not well received the big stars were by local residents? Oh, I think they've always been very well received. As I said, Gertrude Lawrence, for example, became an absolute, uh, oh, she, she was just, just central to the arts culture on the Cape and, and central to, um, to the community. And I, you know, I think that has happened often, that, that often well-known actors come to the Cape and and they make it their summer home and and they get involved in in the theater culture and in the arts on the cape and i think they're incredibly well received okay so we've gone through about a handful of questions i just want to double check facebook i don't see any questions there um so sue let's okay. end off uh with another opportunity for you to plug your book uh where can hey. uh where can viewers uh, uh purchase a copy of your book yeah, one great place is Amazon, of course, and then they can purchase it at uh, Arcadia Publishing, the Arcadia Publishing site. Great, and that's right, my well, publisher, Arcadia. Arcadia, great publisher. We have uh, we 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 host uh, several uh, authors uh, each year. Uh, in fact, we have one coming up who just wrote a book on the history of the Tewksbury State Hospital, oh, uh, nice. and <laughs> Arcadia published that one. Uh, Ashlyn Rickford will be with us. I believe the last Thursday of this month, but don't don't I don't remember the specific date off the top of my head. But anyway, so Sue, uh, any last words for the group before we wrap up? Well, I guess I, I hope to see you on the Cape this summer. Yeah. Come and come and see our wonderful theater. As I said, there there are going to be lots of outdoor performances, so you can feel perfectly safe. Great. Well, that's good to hear, Sue. I hope I hope uh, folks take you up on on uh, your offer and. Hope some folks travel down to the Cape. Makes a great weekend trip, that's for sure. That would be uh, so, so nice. So Sue, thank you uh, very much for the presentation and the video. Thank you, uh, continued success uh, on, on the launch of the book. And yeah, nice. um, wanna thank everyone for joining us live. Uh, those with us live will get an email from me on Monday morning. Uh, please fill out the feedback survey and let us know what you thought. So thank you everyone so much. Enjoy this beautiful weather and I hope everyone enjoys the rest of their afternoon. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Robert. Yep. Thanks, Sue. Have a good one. Bye, all.